Uh, we've got uh, two talks lined up for this final session. Uh, the first one is uh, Next Generation Ham TV, which will follow on from the excellent uh, presentation Noel gave before lunch on the existing Ham TV system. And uh, that will be followed after a short break by a uh, talk on the CubeSat simulator by Dave G4DPZ. Um, I'd like to say uh, hello to our worldwide audience. I gather that uh, John VU2JO is one of those uh, watching this event from India. Right, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Phil. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm Phil Crump, M0DMY, um, and I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the what could be called the next gen ham TV um, and what we're looking at for uh, something new to go on the ISS. Um, so some of you may have seen Noel's uh, presentation earlier about the current ham TV unit that uh, that's was up there for quite a few years um, and uh, we're now trying to get uh, put up there again to continue that capability. Um, this so this unit that unit is S band downlink out uh, so there's a couple, t a pair of antennas on the Columbus module, uh, both of which are dual L and S band, and the Ham TV currently uses one of them uh, in just S band. Uh, so there's the potential for quite a bit more capability there, both using the the other antenna, but also using uh, the dual band side of things. Um, so it, if we start to look at this uh, as what we could do with those antennas. The functionality in that unit, that unit is obviously designed just for the camera downlink, the video and audio downlink, um, and so is quite inflexible um, in what else we can do with it. Um, and the, there's been talk about how we could use it for sending arbitrary other data down, uh, but the only feasible method that's, that's, um, that's been thought of so far is embedding QR codes or barcodes inside the inside the MPEG-2 compressed video pictures, uh, which is not an ideal ideal way of doing things. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the other thing with the current unit is that there is one flight model with no, no engineering model and no spares, which is one of the main reasons why uh, what's quite rare for hardware on orbit is it being brought down for repair and then being sent back up again. It's normally cheaper just to get the engineering model fixed and then send that up, but that, that didn't exist for this one. Um, so there, there was then the question of, of, can we do better than this with the capability? Um, and uh, Aris US um, uh, co contacted us, us being uh, BATC and AMSAT UK, uh, to ask whether there was something we could do with the current technology we've got in ports down, and the, the flexibility that we've got in what we can transmit from ports down, both on the digital TV side of things, but also on the narrow band in exactly the same unit, using exactly the same hardware. Um, and, and of course the fact that, that we're working quite regularly up at S band and the higher microwave bands, uh, so is there something we can do using those S and L band antennas? Um, and part of the uh, Part of the reason for this as well is although the ISS has limited life, um, so the, there's currently a bit of uncertainty about how long, um, uh, how long uh, American operations are going to continue on the ISS, but we're also looking forward to, uh, to Lunar Gateway when that happens, when they put a station out there. Uh, my understanding is that they've already started uh, asking questions about um, it, has ARIS got anything that we could put out there? on the first module to go out there. Uh, so it'd be great to have something set up for that where the link budgets are, are a little more challenging for that. Um, so the, there's been a s small team of us so far have been talking to Aris US, uh, talking to their engineering team, uh, trying to find out more, more about what they want um, and see what we can come up with for this. Uh, so th thinking about what we what we can do better, how we can make better use of the system. Um, so one of the one of the things that was mentioned in Noel's talk earlier was that the uh, the system was on only on very intermittently, um, and then also outside of Aris contacts, the camera tends to be unplugged, so you get the black screen with the blue line on the left. Um, 
and or, although that's that's great from building a ground station point of view, and then you see that blue line and you know and the hiss on the audio, and you know you've got it. Um, the it, it, it's not great for getting students involved, and the ideal thing would be something that students can put together a ground station, and they can then receive receive the the downlink from the ISS. And you don't want them putting in hours of work to then end up with a black screen and a bit of hiss on the audio, and you tell them that's it, well done. Um, so, so it'd be great to have have something there there that's always on that they can receive, um, similar to to how APR people do receiving of the APRS and also the SSTV as well that's already up there. Um, one of the other things that that's come up is that uh, there's a number of student science experiments on station, uh, particularly uh, AstroPi has been one of the very successful ones. And uh, the original generation of AstroPi, I believe, involved uh, the astronaut actually having to take the SD card out, put it in a laptop, and then email the results manually down uh, to the schools. Uh, that, that's now been changed. I believe they, the ground crew now has remote access over IP to do that. Uh, but wouldn't it be great if we could um, downlink them through amateur radio and get the students as well. Uh, they, they might have one half of the student team does the experiment on orbit, and the other half builds the ground station to get those results directly down back to the school. Um, so if we could, if we could put in some way that this can be interfaced to student experiments on there to provide this data downlink, this would be another use of it outside of using it for video for the school contacts. If we wanted to do that as well, um, so. The one of the other things was uh, so flexibility of modulation. Currently, the ham TV system that's up there has, I think, a switch on the front that switches it between 1.3 mega symbol and 2 mega symbol, um, and though the, that's that's the two settings on it, um, but uh, that also affects the video coding and such, I believe. Um, but it would be great to be able to have that more flexible, both in terms of the symbol rates we could use, but also in terms of the modes we could use. Uh, so one of the things we're in thinking here about is the accessibility of it. So putting together an S-band ground station with a tracking dish is quite a big project for a school or for young people to put together. And so, but we, we, we've got this transmitter with a certain amount of power to the patch antenna. Could we instead maybe for a, a fraction of the time or certain scheduled periods, have it go to a uh, lower symbol rate modulation. Um, so thinking something like on the order of the funky downlink at, at 1.2 kilosymbol BPSK, um, if you were to do that with the same power out, um, you would then be able to receive this, uh, we reckon, with a quadrophila helix antenna that you've made yourself out of a bit of copper wire plugged barefoot into a Pluto with no LNA. There should be enough link budget at that point to make that work. You're not going to get much data through it, uh, but you're certainly not going to get video and audio through it, but you could get uh, experiment data through it. You could get fitter messages. You could get uh, telemetry off any internal sensors in the device, that kind of thing. And that then, that then provides some, some difficulty levels where you can start off with a Pluto handmade QFH antenna, and then try putting that, uh, making a feed for a dish and hand pointing a dish and see if you can get the higher data rate, see if you can then get images and then going all the way up to something that's capable of receiving the live video from a contact would provide a number of different, different steps that you could tailor to different groups. Uh, remote configuration is another thing. So every, everything on the, the current unit that's up there is, is manual switches, uh, requiring the astronaut to go and make changes, and then the astronaut to tell you when they've made the change. Um, and as, as they've done with the AstroPi, if we could also get remote IP connectivity, then authorized ground crew, which wouldn't be us, it, it would be those already working with Aris and NASA, uh, would be able to log in and make changes for us. So. Uh, for example, schedule these changes to the modulation or, or make adjustments or, or put new content on there, new fitter messages, new images, that kind of thing. Um, there, there's then the, the question of we've got this L and S band, dual band capability, so could we do something with a receiver up there? 
um, and run duplex operation with some kind of transponder. So we end up with an on-orbit digital TV repeater. And may, maybe not just TV, maybe there's other things you can do with it as well, but the, the idea of having a TV repeater on orbit would be pretty good. Uh, with, with the power budget, with that power budget as well. Um, and then, so, so the, the, the main thinking about this really is, is other things we can do with it. Uh, but if we are putting this transmitter up there, uh, we could also put a video input as well. Uh, which would then allow us to do ham TV-like things on the Lunar Gateway, if it ever went out to the Lunar Gateway. Um, so we can look at putting a, a HDMI input on that um, and also making use of the, the, the higher efficiency video and audio encoding, which might allow us to make the video downlink perhaps a bit more accessible or higher quality. Um, that'll be one of the trade-offs that we need to do. So sort of translating this a bit into a, into a technical, technical wish list at the moment of what we might want from this. So we've got uh, the data from student science payloads, other student science payloads around. So ARIS, ARIS US is working on a student science payload uh, that they plan to put alongside the current ARIS equipment there. Uh, so we'd be looking at definitely an interface to that. Um, at the point we're connected to this, to the station network, it would be nice if the if perhaps the always on beacon could show a video feed from an external camera. But that's that's a bit of a stretch goal at the moment. Uh, due, I, due to how their network works, it's hard, it could be that that's not possible at all. Um, but that would be very nice if we could achieve it. Making sure that some there's some internal beacon to it, so internal images being transmitted, uh, some sort of interesting data when no other input is available. Um, and we can also put in telemetry and health data from the unit so that we can we can keep an eye on the hardware and know it's not overheating uh, and that kind of thing. Um, the other big technical points are the remote login, uh, login over IP for the reconfiguration, as I talked about. And that may also allow for some, uh, some limited uh, software upgrade capability on orbit, us adding new modulations uh, with some very careful testing. Um, then being able to use uh, DVBS2 on the down on the downlink for high bit rate, and then some lower bit rate modes. I, I picked the 1200 board BPSK uh, as is as it's what uh, AO73 uses, but obviously there's quite a wide range between that between the two mega symbol and 1.2 kiloboards. So there's the, there's other things we could do. There's other experiments we could try there. Um, and then having a video, uh, HDMI video and audio input would be good just to be able to uh, ease the interfacing on the cameras and reduce the, the number of adapters and cables uh, that are up there, which all create, create extra work for the astronauts and all mean that work's got to be budgeted in somewhere. So if we can, if we can improve on that, then there's more chance of, more chance of getting it approved to go up. Um, so the conceptual design that we came up with from this um, was going with uh, basically the current structure that we've got from the ports down um, and and similar projects. Um, so we've got the single board computer, the, the, the SBC running the software there connected to an SDR of some kind um, and then transmit up to PA and filters, receive from the bottom with LNA and filters um, and then the other main boxes here for the beacon data, configuration management, IP remote control. We'll need, still need some manual crew control, manual switches on the front, uh, both for fallback if the IP doesn't work for whatever reason, and also being sure that they can switch the transmitter off during EVAs and docking and such. Uh, that'll be a hard requirement. Um, and then the, the, the inputs there from the, uh, the student science payloads. So the idea with this is mainly that using the software modem here with the SDR transceiver allows us to not be tied into any particular modulation mode at this point, to any particular symbol rate. So we, we then put together a, uh, a demonstration unit um, very early this year. Um, so the, the, the enclosure here and uh, much of the internal electronics uh, was assembled by Gareth, G4XAT. 
who uh, nicely made up all the 3D printed parts to mount this. And the idea was to put together something in a form factor similar to the ISS half rack um, that, that internally showed all these capabilities to try, try and show what we're getting towards. This is nowhere near what, what the end device is actually going to look like, but we were trying to put go from the diagram into something on the desk that did roughly the same thing. So we've got a flexible voltage input here. One of the big things on the ISS is uh, all the different power supplies and all the different modules. Uh, so we went with a DC-DC on the input uh, to provide the flexible voltage there. Uh, we've then got the network connectivity. So this obviously connects straight in just into the Pi. And we've then got the transmit and receive to the two antennas, which in this case connect to a Lime SDR inside. And on the front panel, on the front panel, we've then got a power switch on the left, uh, which just controls the main power, and then a configuration mode switch on the right to demonstrate the switching between two different uh, transmitter configurations. So the, uh, the two different configurations we went with for this one were DVBS2 uh, at 250 kilosymbols uh, wideband, uh, so this is obviously isn't extremely wideband, uh, but was enough to to demonstrate uh, the the range that we could do. And uh, for narrowband, I put on a JT4 narrowband beacon. This was trying to go with something really down far down the far end of the scale. Uh, JT4 is probably not a good choice for for the end unit, uh, but was really trying to demonstrate the difference between the two things that we could do here. And this was then switched in the IQ data that went out to the Lime SDR. Um, so, so that allowed, uh, that meant that from switching the switch on the front to the modulation mode actually switching was less than 100 milliseconds. It's, it's pretty much instantaneous. There's a bit of the FIFO on, with the Lime SDR emptying, which is about 100 milliseconds. But then after that, it was a straight switch over to the other mode. Uh, to demonstrate uh, sensor data input, we then put a couple of sensor boards on the top. So we've got a temperature and humidity sensor and, and an accelerometer on the I squared C. And this provided us with a real-time sensor uh, stream, which changed when you moved the box around. Um, and that was then encoded in an extra program stream uh, in the MPEG TS. So where uh, nulls would normally be mixed in when you had a bit of overhead, uh, instead, this mixed in uh, data data packets in the 188 byte transport stream frames there. Um, and then on the other on the other side of this demo, we had Mini Tuner running Longmind, so the same software that's used in Ride and Portsdown, and that was modified to detect this uh, extra the extra PID of this extra program stream, and to then unpack that data into live X Y Z temperature, humidity, and such. Um, so we demonstrated this at the uh, ARIS uh, International Meeting in Eztec earlier this year. Um, and they very much liked the idea. So since then, this is the, this is the hardware design that we've sort of evolved that to uh, at this point. Um, so on the top left here, you've got 28 volt power. So the current thinking is that we use one of the 28 volt feeds from the new Aris, um, Aris, uh, I forget the, the exact name, but the, the new power supply system they've got uh, has a, several spare 28 volt uh, outputs that we can use. So we'll have an always available power supply, which is another limitation of the, of the current unit. Um, we would then have uh, some distribution inside that and also power supply control, uh, particularly for the PA there. Um, HDMI interface for the camera, which is, is secondary but still a good thing to put in. Um, and then you've got the, the other remote interfaces are the Ethernet. And we're also, uh, th there's been some question over how we'd integrate to the other um, science payloads and USB has come up. Uh, so it might be that we break USB also out to some kind of backplane connector, uh, just allow that, to allow that to be used. Um, if if there's a payload that wants USB, then it can just plug in as a USB device into the Pi, um, and then we can we can ideally get someone to upload a driver for it, 
um, and get that added in as a bit of telemetry into the stream. Uh, Raspberry Pi we've gone with in the middle here, partly because it's got a, a, a bit of heritage on the space station being used in the Astra Pi system. Um, and so we reckon we'll, we'll be able to uh, more easily get, get approval for using that. For the SDR side of things, we're, we're thinking of using one of the mini uh, USRPs. Um, so these are, these are effect, uh, effectively, uh, so the one, the one we're looking at is one of the USRP uh, B200 uh, mini series. And these are effectively um, a USB 3 connected Okay, they're not quite a version of version of the Pluto because the Pluto's got an SOC on it, but um, they the RF capability on it is basically the Pluto, but they've got a USB 3 connection on the back, and they they're also um, reassuringly expensive in that they don't tend to compromise much of their component choice for cost, uh, like like the Pluto does do, does do being a teaching tool. Uh, so we're we're wanting a bit of we're we're looking for ideally to try and maximize both the reliability there, but also the uh, stability of the thing, so temperature stability and such. And if we can get that out of the box with that USRP, it just it just eases things there. And um, we're also, um, we would like for the output spectrum to be as clean as possible, which is, is another factor that I'll talk about. Um, so USB 3 to USRP. Uh, again, it's just streaming IQ, so we can continue to use the kind of software modulation that we use on ports down and the similar transmitters. And then that can also do duplex um, out on S band and in on L band. Um, so here, the, the L band is, uh, is a bit of an extension goal here. We're keen not to engineer ourselves away from it, but we're sort of not, not looking at it as initial functionality but we're going to make sure that the hardware is capable of it. Sensors and telemetry feed into the Raspberry Pi. So this will be things like uh, HPA temperature, current, uh, current consumption on the different supplies. So if we're not seeing um, so much RF output or if the RF output appears to have dropped off, we can have a look at what the temperature on the PA is, have a look at how much current it's drawing, check the voltage is still, still correct and not sagging at all, and that kind of thing. Uh, that that'll be connected on I squared C or similar integrated with the Raspberry Pi. And the idea with this is that then it shouldn't have too many separate components to it. So the current status of this project is uh, we're, we're still really at the point of nailing down the requirements on this. And one of the things that has come up recently with the current ham TV is the, is the spectral requirements. Uh, so the, Noel mentioned that the current ham TV unit is uh, in in requirement of some extra filtering uh, because it has quite a quite a wide band uh, noise level out of the PA, and we we would really like uh, the output stage to be as flexible as possible, um, and that's going to mean that when we're transmitting these narrow ones, for example, there is extra spectrum which we don't want to have to filter. Um, so we need to make sure that with this USRP and PA combination, uh, we can s we can still hit those spectral requirements. And we're currently we're, we're working with the RSUS team uh, with the with the filters for the current unit, and through that we're trying to understand what these requirements are, so that we can get this on the bench, we can test it at our end, and we can make sure early on that this this solution is is going to pass that test at that point. If we do need filtering, we might have to put in some additional filtering. Um, but being able to engineering, engineer it early means that if we have 2 dB loss through the filter, we can up the drive power by 2 dB, assuming other things allow that. One of the other things that, that would be a concern there is thermal. Um, so the, we've been assured that this should be reasonably manageable, uh, but there is, of course, a limit how much, um, how much we can dissipate in that. Uh, things get a lot more complicated if we start having to put fans on it. And we are, it is probably looking like if we have the 10 watt PA on there, we're going to have to have a fan of some kind on that. Um, but keep, keeping that down, keeping that as simple as possible uh, would really be ideal. Uh, there's, there's still a whole bunch of uh, trade-offs that we need to think about. Um, so things like um, 
each of the antennas is a dual L and S band in itself. So we could, of course, put in a diplexer and just connect to one antenna. Uh, but that's another part that's got to be integrated. It's going to make the box quite a bit bigger. It's probably going to sacrifice a bit of sensitivity on the uplink. Um, and actually, given that these two antennas are available, it, if we just have an extra cable to connect to the other antenna, um, then that, that might work better. And these, these antennas, I believe, are physically spaced on the outside of the Columbus module as well. Kieran's nodding. Um, so you get a bit of bit of isolation from from where they are on the outside of the Columbus module there. Um, it, looking at the video video input, uh, one of the questions that's come up uh, this has come up may uh, quite recently uh, because of the uh, new Pi Five is of course a potential thing for this. We want to make sure that there's enough processing power in it that we can do what we want to do in the future. Doing a one mega symbol DVBS two. Um, in, uh, modulating that into IQ is actually quite quite easy on the Pi 4. There's still quite a bit of resource available, but we want to make sure we're not engineering ourselves out of anything for the future. So do we start to have a look at the Pi 5? But then the Pi 5 doesn't have a hardware encoder for the video. Um, and wha one of the things we want to do is make sure, of course, that any encoded video is going to stay within the bitrate. And uh, if you've played around with OBS and the ports down transmitter, you'll have probably spent quite a bit of time tuning the bitrate on OBS to make sure your peaks aren't overflowing and causing picture glitching. Um, we, we don't want to be doing that on orbit. And uh, the, from what we've seen on the ham TV, uh, the inside of the modules, it's, there's a lot of detail in the background. Uh, there's a lot of detail to encode. It's probably going to be quite challenging for the encoder. It's going to end up using quite a bit of bitrate if we go with a software encoder for that. We would like to use a hardware encoder, but the hardware encoder on the Pi 4 is quite an old hardware encoder and doesn't work as well as the new software encoders. So again, this is another trade-off that, that we're going to have to make. Um, and we are doing a bit of testing on that. Um, if I go back a couple of slides, actually, uh, so one of the bits that I, ha I have started looking at just to get an idea of this is trying out one of the HDMI to CSI boards here with a camera on my desk uh, to see how well the trade-off works between using the hardware encoder and using a software encoder for that. Um, I have a few cables in the background. I haven't quite got it up to the complexity of the space station yet, but I can work on that. So the, the, this is the last slide. The proposed uh, next steps really um, are that um, we're getting to the point where we want to procure the hardware. We still need to sound out these requirements, um, and particularly on the, on the spectrum issues, but also making sure that we're not making, not making any choices that we're going to have to change. OK, making, making as few as possible choices that we're going to have to change something later. We, we accept that new requirements are going to come along, things are going to change, but we want to get as much as possible nailed down before we, before we start buying stuff, investing money, and assembling it. Uh, but for the procurement of hardware, uh, so BATC and AMSAT UK have chosen to jointly fund uh, the, the parts required for putting together a couple of functional assemblies. And the idea is that we, we are going to work on the basically getting the electronics um, all together and functionally working uh, with all the software uh, all the software functionality implemented. Um, and we'll be putting those together as a, a sort of flat sat style, style, so not going for any kind of physical assembly. But then we, the eventual idea is that one of those assemblies will be sent across to the Aris US team. And they, who have lots of experience building the actual kit to go up on the space station, dealing with the actual interfaces there, they know who to talk to. Um, they can design the physical box it's going to go into. And we'll collaborate with them where they could, they. Uh, if they've got questions about how things could be plugged together differently, we can work with them on that. Um, but they can start to put it together into a box, get the, the heat sinks on it. It requires working out where the airflow needs to go and such. And that, that allows them to deal with all their interfaces uh, inside NASA, uh, which solves a few issues with us getting hold of 
uh, the appropriate information for that kind of thing. Um, and then the idea is that uh, running out of battery here. Um, the idea is that there will be at least one other um, assembly unit um, that stays here and then we can continue some of that software development uh, in parallel as well. Continue to iterate on the design, uh, can obviously do a lot more testing, running it on a bench for long periods, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, try and do some environmental testing if we can. Um, but we are also well aware that there will be new requirements uh, that come through. There will be um, the, the, ha the spectrum stuff getting more stringent is a recent change from NASA. During the timescale of this, there will probably be new requirements that come through that we have to cater to. Um, so we'll work with them to to make sure that we can, well, to, to as best we can, engineer towards being able to achieve those. Um, so that's it. Um, any questions on that? So looking at the block diagram you've got up there at the moment, um, obviously at the moment you've, you've proven that you know you can do the, the encoding and so on on the Pi and it all works. But if you add that duplex functionality and you're now trying to demodulate, decode something coming in on the L band, that's potentially a lot of extra load, I.O. bandwidth and so on on the Pi. Are you concerned about that? Uh, so yes, that is a that is a concern. Um, so one of the reasons we're looking for the this uh, looking at the CSI interface for the HDMI, uh, which I think I've run the battery out on that as well, um, was to uh, make sure w was to keep it off the USB bus there. Um, so the ig ignoring the potential for the mission control stuff, which if it was on USB, I imagine would be very low bit rate. The only thing we should have on the USB 3 is the USRP and the Ethernet again should be low bit rate. So yeah, IO I owe input output bandwidth is, yeah, that, that's a concern. Also CPU usage if we start having to demodulate uplinks. If we want to do a TV transponder on it, we're going to have to do a software modem de decoder, which is, has been a hot topic this weekend, talking about potential replacement for the mini tuner. Um, so yes, that, that's, it might not be a TV uplink for that reason. Um, but we need to think about things. That's another thing where I think the, the, the Pi 5 does have a bit more uh, IO bandwidth on its USB 3 and such. Um, I, I should also mention there are other alternatives to the Pi. We have sort of looked at the Jetson, uh, particularly the new series of Jetson boards have some nice hardware video encoders, quite a bit of processing power, uh, but they're also quite power hungry, up to 60 watts or so, um, and they tend to come on sort of development boards that aren't going to be easy to integrate. Um, so we are keeping an eye on those and working out if something can work, but uh, the, the Pi is the one where we're leaning towards at the moment. Uh, thank you very much for all that, Phil. Um, frequency allocation for this, is this going to be on the existing frequencies used by um, the uh, video equipment on board the ISS, or is it going to move into the traditional area <coughs> of uh, amateur radio satellite allocation on S-band? Uh, because I would remind you, if you're transmitting narrow band beacons, you will then overlap with the QO100 uplink, which is 2400 for the first 500 kilohertz. So there could be a, a little competition there. Uh, yes, that, 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 that's a good point. Um, the, the current thinking is that we would stick with whatever the current frequencies are, but that's the... That, that's one of the questions that we're aware might change later, um, and that's why we're keen to go towards this SDR design that allows us to be quite flexible in terms of the frequency output that we can use.
Thanks. Uh, given the power limits we're likely to get because of on 23 SEMS uplink because of Galileo, what do you think the um, given the link budget you'll have for the patch antennas, what data rate do you think it'll actually get through on the uplink? So, you know, what can we do with it? Have you got an order of magnitude in mind? Uh, honestly, that's not something we've looked at yet at all. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much.